Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, you'll have to excuse my very croaky voice. I've got a bit of a, a bug here. Um, I'm here today with Mark Smith, who's Professor of Social Work at the University of Dundee in Scotland. Hello, Mark. Morning, Tina, or evening. Nice to talk to you. You're going to have to do a lot of talking so I don't have to talk so much. Yes. <laughs> Um, now, why don't we go back and, and you can tell us a little bit about your background and how how you got involved in the whole business of historic sexual abuse. Yeah. Um, well, my background is in residential childcare. Um, so I spent about almost 20 years working in residential childcare from the early 80s onwards. And um, during that time, I used to play football with, I worked in a residential school, what would have been an improved school, and we used to play football twice a year with a similar school in England. And, yeah. um, you know, great times, we'd go down there for a weekend, he would come up to us for a weekend, and one of the highlights that I remember from my time in residential childcare, and thought nothing of it. And, and you were, you were as, a course, as a teacher, you, you were a teacher, you were... What were you doing? In, what I, was role what was called, you I was what was called a residential social worker. The, okay. the sort of boundaries between teachers and social workers were sort of blurred. Okay. That teachers would do a lot of the residential duties as well. But my, yeah. my um, I, I was a residential social worker. I started as an unqualified um, residential social worker. I had a degree, but not a relevant degree. Then I went back to my social work qualification and stayed mm -hmm. for the rest of my career in residential childcare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we so okay. we played football regularly, and then over the towards the end of the nineteen nineties, there started to be the sort of revelations of abuse in residential childcare, and in the UK that started around North Wales, and yeah. then the school that I you used to visit in England became caught up in the backlash there. I was just across. Um, the English border into Merseyside and a whole number of staff there started to become to be accused of abuse I think over 90 in total now in the event only one was two were convicted one was released on appeal so a massive number of staff sort of caught up in this um, outbreak of allegations of abuse but as I say only one conviction and, 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 these, and these included people you knew well uh, I knew reasonably well, but really yeah. limited. I, I, I spent weekends there and I you know, sort of got to know one or two of the individuals. I can't say I knew them you know, particularly well. No, no. And to be honest, when these allegations broke, you know, my initial reaction was there were so many of them. There must be some truth in it. I didn't see it myself, but there must be some truth there. So that, that was my initial position. Yeah. And you know, I knew that people there and who knew the place more than I did were starting to ask questions. But the so scale came off my eyes, scales came off my eyes when I read a book called The Secret of Brineston by Richard Webster. Now Richard yeah. describes himself as a cultural historian and he wrote a forensic, for me a compelling book around events in North Wales. And essentially, he sort of deconstructed the whole dominant story of what you know, is said to have gone on in North Wales and tells a very different story. Or if he doesn't tell a different story, he certainly deconstructs the, the, the dominant one, which is set out in a sort of government report, the Waterhouse report. And I think you know, Webster really challenges your know, the Waterhouse inquiry and the conclusions drawn from it. And there's can some other tell, writing. Can you tell us, uh, Mark, tell us a bit more about the Waterhouse inquiry and it, it why was that massive. was called and what did that conclude? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was a massive in, inquiry um, and it basically concluded that it 
th there were a number of allegations of sort of um, organised abuse. And to be fair, Waterhouse didn't substantiate those. He didn't find any evidence of abuse, but he did actually conclude that there had been a lot of abuse within particular sort of children's homes and schools within the North Wales area. Um, but really the evidence for his conclusions didn't necessarily stack up. And I think that's yeah. where Richard Webster came in and took it, you know, took it apart a bit. And um, yeah. so I, I um, this, this is a book which is over 700 pages long. I think it took Richard about nine years to write. Um, and he interviewed a whole number of people. The, the starting point was that people who had worked there had approached Richard and said, look, this didn't happen like this. This isn't an accurate picture of the school in question. And Richard, I think, was sceptical initially, but the more he dug into it, um, the more he realised that people were sort of you know, accurate in what they were saying about the place, that you know, much of what is claimed to have happened didn't or couldn't. Um, so he, he wrote this book. I actually reviewed it for a journal, a child abuse journal, in fact, and I'm thinking this is good news, you know, that you know the scale of abuse was not as nearly as you know as big as is claimed to be. And I got a response from the book reviews editor of the journal to say really well written review, good review, and you know, the next stage should have been that he was, I was getting sent proofs for publication. Now, those didn't arrive. So I got in touch and was basically told, oh, you know, there's an issue. I don't think our readers will like the book or like your review <laughs> of the book. So we're going to arrange another review. <laughs> now, that's unheard of. You know, if you review a book, you review a book. And if mm -hmm. it's well enough written and constructed, then it ought to be um, published. But they, they did commission another review by a more sympathetic, a, a reviewer more sympathetic to the journal's audience. Um, and the, I felt that that review was really quite troubling because I came from a position of, you know, trying to adhere to some basic principles of, of justice, if you like, that, you know, you need good evidence to convict somebody. And the, this, it was a social work academic who did the other review and basically says, so what, you know, what is Smith looking for that we go back to where we were, where people were not believed? And that was not my position at all. It was that if you are going to believe people who, you know, make particular claims, you know, you can't just accept it on the basis of what they say that there needs to be corroborating, substanti substantiating evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what was absent in the sort of, um, Waterhouse report, that you know, conclusions were drawn largely on the basis of what people were saying, even when some of the sort of other evidence sort of maybe contradicted those claims. So yeah. that you know, sort of started me off, if you like, um, and just questioning what's going on here. And then I became, you know, aware um, of a whole number of other schools which got caught up in similar claims being made. And again, um, people approached me. The more I looked into it, the more I started to think, well, there's something very odd going on here. Um, but the, the Richard Webster book is fascinating. It, it was shortlisted for an Orwell Prize for political writing. It's actually an incredibly well written book. It's a bit of a page turner, although the subject matter is incredibly serious and the book itself is a sort of compelling <laughs> read. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll put, Mark, we'll put, I'll put details under the video of this, of these references so people can follow them up if they're interested. Mm. Yeah, no, that, I mean, Richard, had, I'm not quite sure if it's still there. Richard died a number of years ago now, mm -hmm. um, but he had a you know, really good website as well where excerpts of the book were available. And I think somebody has kept that going, richardwebster.net. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll have a look at that. Mm -hmm. So this alerted, alerted you to the fact that 
there wasn't necessarily much truth telling going on in relation to this issue. I mean, there was a lot of ideology and, you know, people had beliefs about uh, how widespread this issue is, you know, the whole historic abuse. And, and if you start to challenge that, you're not, you're not very popular. Hmm? I mean, that, that, that's right. I mean, one of the yeah. things that really struck me was that, and I was at that point a reasonably sort of new academic, um, perhaps had been an academic for about five years, and yeah. I thought that my job was to actually you know, come up with stuff that was academically rigorous, and what I came across was you know, the power of ideology and you yeah. know, and a strong sense of what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say in some yeah. of these sort of sensitive, contentious areas. And so it's pretty amazing that you decided to dive deeper, <laughs> having had that shot across your bowels. Yeah, well, I've had a number of shots across my bowels. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I know, um, and but there is something which is quite compelling about, intellectually so, about the sense that I you know, have this other story to tell, if you like, and I have yeah. some evidence for this. And it's, yeah. you know, it needs to be out there. And I'd rather it wasn't me that was doing it, but I think somebody <laughs> has to. Yeah, good for you. So then you got involved in the, in the, what, the famous Jimmy Savile story. Is that right? Yeah. And that, I mean, that was a sort of strange one as well. It's just one of these things that happened. And um, we were actually, a couple of colleagues at Edinburgh University and myself had written an article questioning the Scottish government's response to allegations of abuse. And again, it was one of these situations where they commissioned, uh, you know, a supposedly independent outsider to to do this review. Um, and, you know, I showed it to a couple of my academic colleagues who were sort of looking at it and saying, well, no, this is not, this doesn't stand up. It's not good academic work. We wrote an article on that. And my two colleagues sort of became involved in some of these conversations. And one of them led on a bid to um, get money for us seminar series on um, moral panics, picking up on, you know, an idea from the 1970s on, on moral panic and how particular yeah. issues become moralised and sort of take, um, be, become disproportionate. Um, so we ran a series of seminars on moral panics and we wrote a, or we edited a book on moral panics. And I think that somebody must have noticed that we were doing this work, that they had become aware of the seminar series. And my colleague at Edinburgh got an email out the blue from a woman, you know, who went by the name of Anna Raccoon. And Anna Raccoon was a fascinating character. This this is just after the Savile case broke. I mean, just for by by way of context. And Jimmy Savile was a BBC entertainer. He died in 2011 and was praised for his sort of charity work he did at that point. A year later, um, a different story came out about Savile, that he was a sort of serial sex, um, sex predator. And you know, that started a whole series of events going in terms of um, investigating Savile. So this was going on. Um, yeah. In the backdrop, we were doing this book on moral panics. It wasn't really connected to the Savile case at that point at all. Um, but as I say, my colleague was approached by Anna Raccoon. Um, now, the thing about many of the Savile allegations, the early ones emanate from an approved school in the south of England, a girls' school. Um, which was a sort of experimental school that set up in the 1960s to, to really try and sort of turn girls' lives around. A very well respected school. Yeah. And, and it was targeted at sort of intelligent you know, girls, young women who had gone off the rails a bit. Um, and it was about trying to get their lives back on track. Now, one of those women had gone on to become a lawyer 
and had retired to France and she was involved in blogging. And then when the Savile case broke, um, she started to sort of look at it and see the involvement of the school Duncroft. And she said, hold on a minute, I was there and um, I don't recognise it. And some of the claims <laughs> were that Savile in the mid 1960s had the runoff Duncroft was essentially using the place. One of the quotes was as a paedophile sweetie shop and was using visits to Duncroft to abuse girls there. Um, and Anna Raccoon was saying, actually, I recognise the woman who is making these claims. I shared a dormitory with her. And yeah. um, that was in 1966. And I never ever saw Savo in Duncroft and I was never aware that he was in Duncroft. And actually, the more we looked into this, the more we, we, we realised that Savo had never set foot in Duncroft until I think it was 1974. And that is... Yeah. You know, evidence in police reports subsequently as well. That's not just us li you know, listening to people who tell us that. But we did actually interview the, the girl, the woman who uh, introduced Savile to Duncroft. And the whole so, you know, context of him being there was far more prosaic than you know, the, this sense that he targeted the school to go and abuse girls. Um, there was a connection there. Um, so, yeah, Anna Raccoon started to write in her blog about the Duncroft case, and she's a brilliant writer, really entertaining. But the initial um, contact with my colleague at Edinburgh was to say, look, um, I have a mound of information which gives a very pi different picture of the Savile case by this stage. She had been speaking to other former pupils and to staff members. Um, and, you know, it needs a book and I would write it myself, but um, you know, I'm, I'm on borrowed, borrowed time, I have cancer. And she did have, she lasted longer than you know, she anticipated at the time when she kept writing her blog, but she died a number of years ago now. Yeah. But she gave us a number of contacts and she gave us you know, a, a, a whole lot of um, written material as well. And our, her desire was that we sort of preserve this for posterity. She said, you know, historians in the future will want to look at this. Um, so we got some money from the Economic Social Research Council, which is a major funding body in mm -hmm. the UK, and they put out a call for urgent grants. Um, so we applied, and I said we, it was myself and Ros Burnett, um, who's a criminologist at Oxford University, and who's one of the few academics who writes on this sort of subject as yeah, well yeah. and does so mm -hmm. incredibly well. Um, so Ros and myself got money from the USRC. We did a number of interviews with former pupils, with former staff members and with others who had you know, information to give us on the sample case. We didn't manage to do as many as we would have liked. There was still investigation, police investigations going on. The headmistress was sort of subject to some of these. She didn't want to speak to us at that point. Um, because of everything else that was going on. Um, but we did get a couple of former staff members and we got four, I think, former pupils who were telling us very different stories about Duncroft. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this information which is sort of safeguarded, which is all Anna Raccoon's blogs, um, yeah. which, which are actually still available. Some you know, fan of hers actually sort of leaked reconstructed the website as well. I think that's still there. But some brilliant writing, really taking apart some of the sort of Savile stuff and some of the characters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who were responsible for, for taking it forward. So that's how I got involved in the Savile case. Um, and and so you, wrote about, you wrote about this, but there have also been other investigations into Savile which essentially cast a lot of doubt on the accusations about against him. Isn't that right? It does need to be said that there is a lot of publicly available footage of Savile behaving in ways that, certainly by today's standards and perhaps the standards of any day, that would be considered to be inappropriate. And he seemed to have a particular liking for young girls. So I'm not going to sit here and say that he didn't behave in ways that he shouldn't have behaved in and that he may have behaved criminally. 
but the evidence is not strong. It's things yeah. like you know, an anonymous witness told us that they saw somebody who they thought looked like Jimmy Savile walking past the hospital. You know, that, that, that was the sort of strength of a lot of the evidence. But the, the main evidence in the Savile case, and this is really concerning actually, was a report um, called Opera on, on, on Operation Utree called Giving Victims a Voice, which reported, yeah. I think, in 2013. And the concerning aspect about that was it was a report that was jointly conducted by the police and by a large children's charity, the NSPCC. Yeah. Um, and it essentially found Gert Savile guilty. So you've got the claims that Savile was a sub serial you know, sexual predator, the most serial sexual predator that we've ever come across, without any due process, actually. He was found guilty yeah. by you know, the NSPCC and the Metropolitan Police without any sort of trial. Now, that, I remember a conversation with Richard Webster. Richard had got yeah. in touch with me to say his real concern around some of this stuff was that it really sort of cast doubt on some of the essential tenets of justice. You know, the, yeah. uh, the innocent until proven guilty um, and, you know, beyond reasonable doubt. And I think that once we have the police and children's charities pronouncing somebody guilty, then that has implications for the whole justice system. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's what would concern me as much as anything. You know, regardless of the findings, and I think the findings, I'll come on to this, I think many of the findings are questionable, but it's the process which I think is, is completely wrong. Yeah. Um, if I come on to the findings, one of the people we interviewed was fairly close to the Savile sort of situation, and she questioned a police officer about some claims made. Now, what happened is, you know, you've got the press being fed your know, stories about, you know, we now have a dozen complaints about Savile, we now have a hundred, we now have 300, 500, a yeah. thousand. And, you know, the woman we were speaking to was speaking to a police officer and saying, you know, tell me about these claims. What sort of substance do they have? Um, and he says, well, what happens is somebody phones up and says, I've got something to say about Jimmy Savile, and we record it. And, she, yeah. you know, this this informant says, so what do you do then? Do you go and investigate it? And he says, no, no, no time to investigate. We're only concerned with your know, offenders who are still living. Um, so essentially these 300, 500,000 claims are people phoning up to say something about Jimmy Savile, but nothing is investigated. You know, it doesn't say whether Jimmy Savile sort of looked at me funny, whether he attempted to rape me, whether he was the best guy in the world and did great charity work. So none of those claims are evaluated. You've just got somebody writing them down, enumerating them, and then putting that number into the public domain to create a particular picture. But, you yeah. know, again, pronouncing somebody guilty of being a serial you know, predator without giving any evaluation to the claims or certainly without making any evaluation in the may have done public. I mean, what's interesting about Savile is I notice, you know, if you Google him, it's always, you know, convicted pederast. I mean, that's sort of, it's just part of the culture now. Um, well. Uh, he pops up in comedy skits. He pops up. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. that That's it. He, yeah. That's his reputation forevermore now. And it's impossible to disprove that, isn't it? Abs 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 absolutely. Yeah. And in some ways... Savile was an easy sort of target for that kind of sort of yeah. reputational risk because he was different, he was quirky, he didn't yeah. sort of fit the, the bill for the cool entertainer. Um, yeah. But you, you know, Rose and I wrote a wee piece, I think we were talking about Jimmy Savile was actually pro for a, a new way of dealing with sexual offences, which was just about believe the victim. So I think, you know, Savile yeah. served a purpose. You're right, he's everywhere. I mean, once the allegations started to emerge, then Savile was in children's homes in North Wales, in Jersey, in Hot de, de, de la Garenne. People were sort of claiming that he was popping up everywhere and abu abusing, or he had popped up everywhere abusing people. Um, 
And there's no way that reputation can be turned around, I don't think. No. But it served a purpose. It has you know, affected a shift in the criminal justice system towards this belief in believing victims. Yeah. And of course, we've seen seen this happening all over the world, or Western world particularly, that yeah. in Australia, we had a big Royal Commission into in, institutional sexual abuse. And it was exactly the same thing, night after night, uh, survivors, as they called them, were paraded in front of our news, you know, news programs, um, telling their stories. All of it was this absolutely accepted, believe the victim stories, and that none of it was ever subjected to any cost, any questioning, requiring any substantive support. Um, and a lot of these people got compensation. Uh, and I know was, you said you told me there was a similar one in Canada as well. Yeah, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And um, again, the whole emphasis was on, you know, it was victim centric. It was yeah. set up to listen to victims rather than to find any balanced view of you know, what was going on in any historical context. And yeah. um, there's uh, some brilliant stuff by, I think, a legal anthropologist, Ronald Neeson. And he wrote a book called, the, the commission was called Truth and Re Reconciliation. He wrote a book called Truth and Indig Indignation, was it? Um, and essentially he had spoken to some of the, it was a religious order, the Oblates, who ran some of the schools who were subject to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the brothers he spoke to were saying, I don't recognise this, it's a very different story. Um, yeah. you know, our memories are that we did our best, we did a lot of good work, our memories are of fun. Um, and, you know, Neeson does a lovely job in terms of trying to balance the different sides of the, the argument there and really constructs it in terms of the two stories, but questions the whole sort of human rights discourse, which drives some of this as well. The, this, yeah. this whole you know, business is driven by lawyers. On yeah. the one hand, personal injury lawyers who claim to be out to, to get redress for victims of abuse and trauma, um, as though you know, they're doing it for altruistic reasons. I mean, if you look at some of the lawyers' websites, they actually name the institutions that they're interested in, say, have you ever been abused in this institution? If so, get in touch. Um, they've gone into prisons and said, you know, poo pooped posters up, have you ever been abused in care? If so, get in touch. And then, of course, what you do is, what happens is you get a number of stories, understandably, which then are claimed to corroborate one another. So you've had a change yeah. in the legal system over the years as well to accept yeah. evidence of like kind. Um, so you, you start to you know, find guilt, people guilty on the basis of um, the number of accusations rather than the quality of the evidence. So you've yeah. got, on the one hand, you've got these personal injury lawyers, and on the other hand, you've got human rights lawyers who are motivated by this idea of, you know, breaches of rights and the need for redress. Um, and that is the discourse which I think is operational yeah. at a sort of governmental level. And, yeah. you know, again, Ronald Neeson asks serious questions of the whole rights lobby and whether it's effective or appropriate um, in terms yeah. of how, how we address these issues. I mean, I think we need to probably say at this point, Mark, that we're not saying there isn't abuse, that, that, that terrible things haven't happened, uh, and that uh, pederasts certainly, uh, you know, abuse ch children in, in some of these settings and so on. But um, what is so difficult to sort out is are uh, these, you know, these huge witch hunts. I mean, I suppose the classic was back in America, you remember the McMartin kindergarten scandal uh, where, yeah. and there were all these allegations of satanic abuse and so on in relation to that. And that all came to nothing. I mean, you know, at the heart of these cases, sometimes there's some real abuse, which we should be concerned about, but and then it turns into this witch hunt and this 
a moral panic. And that's what makes the whole thing so difficult to uh, sort out, isn't it, doesn't it? No, absolutely. Well, one of the things yeah. that Stan Cohen says, and Stan Cohen was you know, one of the early writers on the idea of moral panic, and he yeah. says it's not that there's nothing there. Um, what he questions is the proportionality or disproportionality of the response. Yeah. And I think that that's the, the issue at stake. You know, Richard Webster starts off his book by saying that, you know, of course, kids were abused in care as in any setting where adults and children come together. Um, yeah. So schools, youth clubs, wherever, you know, kids are going to be abused. I mean, I, I think myself that kids are more likely to be abused in foster care settings than in residential care settings where you know, things are more visible. But you know, that, that, that's a sort of not another matter. Um, yeah. So absolutely, you know, it's not about questioning the reality of abuse. It's about you know, questioning whether it was on the scale that it is claimed to be. And the consequence of you know, that escalation of claims of abuse is that it's very hard to see what, what the real ones were. You know, the whole thing becomes a morass of claims and you know, real victims are sort of left behind in some of that as well. So you've That's got right. these different claims being made and almost impossible to, to evaluate and to differentiate between them. One of the issues that's always interested me is this claim of huge organised pederast rings. How does that stack up against the actual evidence? Well, as, as I said earlier, one of the conclusions that Waterhouse did you know, find was that there was no evidence of this organised you know, yeah. um, connection of abusers. Now, just common sense would... I mean, I, I, one of the things I bring to this is my experience in residential childcare. And if I or anybody else wanted to abuse kids in care, then you wouldn't say to the person next to me, you know, you're going to abuse these. You keep it secret. You know? um, so I, I can understand that if you can be anonymous, that if you can, you know, yeah, especially with the online environment, I, I, I can imagine that you, you could have these groups forming. But in a day-to-day -day basis in residential childcare, it'd be very difficult because, again, the context is that, you know, these are not closed institutions. Although they're claimed to be, you know, people use Evan Goffman's idea of the total institution that were closed to the outside world. They weren't. You know, they depended yeah. on people coming in from local communities to work there. And not just care staff, not just teachers, but you know, the cleaners, the cooks, who were local women for the most part, who were coming in. So it would rely on a sort of conspiracy that everybody knew these awful things were going on, but nobody said anything. And you know, that doesn't make too much sense to me. Um, so very few claims of these organised paedophile rings within residential care have been substantiated. Um, of course, the, the, the famous it, story it, you told me about is, sorry, Ma, that it was Carl who made these sort of accusations against extraordinary members of the British elite, didn't he? And then that turned, that all fell apart. Can you tell us a bit more about Beach? The Carl Beach story, yeah, that, that was fascinating, where um, you had this guy making outlandish claims really, but again, it was in the wake of the Savile case where the whole thrust was believe the victim. Yeah. So this guy, Carol Beach, came up with claims against some you know, big figures in the British establishment. So Leon Britton, who's former Home Secretary, um, Harvey Proctor, a former Tory MP, and Lord Bramall, who I think had been head of the armed forces, certainly a senior army officer. Um, and a detective stood up in front of the cameras and said, we've got these allegations, we believe them to be credible and true, and yeah. we're going to proceed. And they did proceed. They raided the homes of Lord, you know, of the people that um, Carol Beach had named. Um, and essentially, the whole thing came crumbling down. The, the stories just didn't stack up at all. They weren't credible or true. 
Um, and again, this is one of the sad bits for me is that having said that we would believe Beach, they then threw him to the Lions and he was um, sort of convicted and jailed for 18 years, I think it was, for making these false allegations. And again, the whole story was about how awful Beach was, not about how Beach was arguably a victim of um, some of this wider discourse, which encouraged a guy who was probably not in the best of mental health himself to, to make yeah. up these stories. And I, I think that it is that issue of stories which is really interesting because yeah. you know, within a legal discourse we're led to believe that this is about something which is true or false, you know, right or wrong. And it's more complicated than that. You know, people write themselves into you know, the kind of stories which are widely circulating to, to make sense of their lives. We all do it. We all tell stories to make some sort of sense of our lives. And people yeah. who have had difficulties in their lives can you know, look at the circulating stories and say, well, actually, I wonder if that happened to me. So they write themselves into some of these dominant stories. And I think once they start that, like Beach, then they've got to maintain that story. And, and they really you know, come to say, believe it. You think, I mean, in the, you they know, come to believe it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It becomes, you know, I think yeah. stories are part of how we, our, our identities form. And yeah, they come to believe it. Yeah, I mean, we've had some classic cases in Australia where, um, you know, the, the people who were presenting this sort of evidence were so believable and that's clearly yeah. they believed it themselves and that's the trouble, you know. I, I yeah. remember once sitting at, I was sitting in a case, a terrible case of a headmaster accused of sexual abuse by his, it was just a crazy case, by his adult daughters and... We all sat there in this court case watching them talk about uh, all animals. There were so many animals and ritualistic abuse and, and sadomasochistic stuff and, and coat hangers being used for abortions and cockroaches. And, but it was just f fantastic stuff, amazing stuff. And mm -hmm. clearly these women believed it. And, but they'd been, of course, in that case to a... a a therapist who'd worked on their recovered memories and you know and there was an explanation for how they got into this mindset but you know it is fascinating on a cultural level where we see a whole communities come on board these these witch hunts these you know moral panics uh, a, a, yeah. a really frightening thing really isn't it it, it is and it's um you know, as, as you say, it's powerful stuff. When you hear mm -hmm. this, you think, mm -hmm. you know, people people wouldn't make this up. Why would they make this up? Um, I, I remember a, a number of years ago now, and it must have be, just been round about the time of the sort of Sable case being, um, you know, hitting the papers. I went to see The Crucible that was on in our yeah. local theatre. And yeah. um, you talk about which one there. And... You know, Richard Webster makes, a, I think, a brilliant point in his book that we think we're past that kind of way of thinking, um, that we are rational now. And he says that it's that assumption of rationality which makes us even more vulnerable to believing sort of stories that are you know, yeah. out there. <laughs> and I know. Yeah, it's and then you, we think then you have all rational this... Sorry. So, yeah, sorry, we have go. all these unlikely people coming on board, the combination of feminists with Christian fundamentalists. With, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary how many people are embracing this sort of stuff, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, it, you know, there's a, there's a theologian, I think he is, David Frankfurter, who talks about this... It, it, this desire to protect children and, and protect child, childhood innocence, which is very much part of the human condition. And it does attract yeah. people from a, you know, who would be unlikely bedfellows in other situations. Um, and it creates a very powerful force because, you know, the feminists would say, 
you know, don't lump us with the Christian fundamentalists, and the Christian fundamentalists would say, don't lump us with the feminists, but they're telling the same story to a large extent. Um, so it is a, you know, there's a couple of very powerful lobbies, and it's difficult to try and sort of maintain a sense of perspective within that because it's powerful. Yeah. And it's, but it, I mean, and it's but not it is rational. A, sorry, Ma. What, what I think is it's also fascinating is. Sorry, you go. Say that again. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm saying a lot of this is, is primal. It's not rational. And that's, I think, Richard Webster's point. It's something about the human condition which you know, looks to such stories. Yeah. And of course, what has always fascinated me because of my years ago, I had a sort of background as a sex therapist. And I don't understand the fascination with sex here. I mean, the fact that mm. so many people have this obsession with the damage mm. caused by sexual abuse and, and, and get so much more irate about the idea of children being sexually abused than they would children being half beaten to death or you know, emotionally abused or treated abominably in every other conceivable way. That is nothing yeah. compared to a child having, you know, an uncle place uh, a hand on her, her thigh or whatever it is. I mean, I, I, tell me, tell, why this, Why sex? Why are so, so many people, including I mean, people in prison, beat up sex offenders, don't they? I mean, it's seen as the most horrendous crime, and I've never really understood that. Yeah, again, Richard Webster says it's because we fail to recognise the sort of power of our sexual imaginations as human beings. Um, and I think, you know, if you think about the Christian fundamentalists forever, and for instance, if you repress that side of yourself, then it's going to pop up in different places, you're going to see it. Um, and again, if you see all men as abusers, then you're going to sort of imagine some of this sexual abuse happening. Um, but you, you're right, and there's some weird stuff goes on about some of the demonization of sex offenders, especially in jails, because yeah. I, I liken it to some of the sort of treatment of gays you know, where some of the most vocal sort of people who were most vocal in attacking gays were probably dealing with some sort of sexuality issues of their own. You know, this is not straightforward. It gets to yeah. some of the deepest sort of recesses of the human psyche, I think, in the human sexual imagination. Yeah, yeah. But looking at you, we started off talking about the institutions and which you, where you have a lot of knowledge about what goes on there. And of, a, of course, the implicate, I mean, it's just extraordinary thought. If you have 90 people in a big institution being accused of sexual assault or sex, sex, you know, sexual misconduct, um, an incredible impact on those people's lives. And probably a lot of them will never rid themselves of the, you know, the black cloud. Uh, that comes from being falsely accused. Yeah, you don't recover from that. Um, yeah. And you're not allowed to recover from that because the assumption is that you got off because the evidence wasn't strong enough, not that you yeah. didn't do it. Um, but the impact psychologically is just horrendous. I mean, <clears throat> Ross Burnett has been brilliant in you know, being one of perhaps the only academic I can think of who is looking at the impact yeah. of this on those who have been falsely accused and in many cases falsely convicted. Our initial work was looking at those falsely accused and falsely convicted and strong pressure not to publish the stuff about those who were um, wrongly convicted or who you know, claim their innocence whilst in jail. Um, and she just sort of published on that now and is continuing to do so. And it's heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. there are two sets of victims here. There are those kids who have been abused um, and there are staff who are falsely accused. And, yeah. you know, neither are well served by the way that we're dealing with this situation currently. Absolutely. So, Ros Burnett is how I 
she introduced me to you and I was very, I'm very grateful to her for doing that. I'll, I'll give put out details of her book, which is called her most recent book called Wrongful Accusations. I'm oh, sorry, Wrongful Allegations of Sexual and Child Abuse, which is a, a wonderful collection of pieces, including one by you, Ma, um, which people might like to read. Now, you, you, I know you're preparing another book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. <coughs> I mean, one one of the, I mean, as I've touched on this idea that this is about stories and the way that people tell stories about their lives. And when I say that, I don't mean, you know, they're telling fibs. That, as I say, we all tell stories. It's how we understand our lives. And people understand them, their lives in different ways. And some of the reports that you read on, you know, what it was like in institutional care, give two very divergent views. People, Some people are saying these were the best days of my life, I had a wonderful childhood, and others were saying I was abused day and daily and you know, disrespected and given cold porridge to eat. And you know, so, some of these stories just don't compute. So what, I've, what I'm doing at the moment is that I'm interviewing a number of boys who I looked after in a what was called in Scotland LSD school over the course of the 1980s and I'm getting their life histories about you know life before they went into the school their experiences in the school and you know subsequent experiences and it's been quite incredible it's been a you know really powerful experience for me making contact with these kids again sometimes they've made contact with me um, and our whole relationship is a very different one we're We'd see each other as friends. We catch up occasionally. Um, the deputy headmaster of the school died recently, and the day before he died, I was down at his bedside with two former pupils. You know, some really lovely yeah. touches. Um, but I mean, one, one, the story. Yeah, sorry, but one of the things you mentioned to me is just this. I think there's an assumption that all this residential care is, a, you know, is always a horrible place and. And particularly if it's a place for troubled kids. And yet what you said to me is, you know, many people who look back on those days um, as, you know, having been a, a, a very good childhood with people caring for them. And it's not all negative, is it? Absolutely. I mean, I was a mm -hmm. bit wary about what people might tell me. Um, yeah. But it's unremittingly positive. You know, they're yeah. saying, I felt safe there. I had great relationships there with other boys and with staff members. I had great experiences to talk about, you know, going all over the world actually on holidays, um, as well as sort of regular cycle trips, you know, camping yeah. trips, football trips. You know, they, <laughs> they actually talk about a wonderful childhood. But this idea of safety was a central one. And none of them yeah. recognise these stories of abuse. And, you know, what they're saying is, if that happened, it'd be said spread like wildfire. We'd have known about it. And one of them in particular is saying, you know, I've racked my brains. I just can't see that. Um, yeah. And I've racked my brains. You know, I've wondered, have I missed, did I miss stuff? Um, one of the difficulties is that, and sorry, the, the other thing is that a number of these kids, no, there, there are very sad aspects as well. A lot of the kids died. Now, how that is often represented is that, you know, they had awful childhoods and awful experiences yeah. and kids, so they turned to drinking drugs. And the boys, the men I spoke to, you know, give a different picture of that. You know, they say these kids actually left care at a particular time when drugs were rife and they got into drugs, but they got into drugs really to fill the hole that was left by leaving care where they didn't have the sort of routine, the good experiences, the good relationships, and there was no jobs available at the time. Those who actually yeah. got past those initial few years have gone on to have as productive and as sort of happy lives as you know, the majority of kids who were mm. brought up in similar circumstances so, and have done well. And yeah. actually, interestingly, their own kids are doing well. You know, none of their own oh, kids are... Good. Yeah. Well, I think, no, some, I think there'll be, when, yeah, that sounds very good. I mean, it's nice to see a different point of view from the, 
horror stories we've all been reading. So I yeah. think that that's a very positive contribution. Mark. I think we better, call, uh, call, you know, call, bring this to a hold. I'm sure I could talk to you for, for many hours, um, but I'm, I'm, I imagine there are many people listening to this who are intrigued to, to hear this broader view of the, the whole issue of um, historic sexual abuse and, and witch hunts and moral panics. We rarely have open discussions around this issue. It's one of the classic areas which has been closed down and steeped in ideology. And so I'm very glad you've been he here today to, to share your experiences, Mark. Thanks very much, Tina. It's been good talking to you. Nice to talk to you. We'll keep in touch. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.